Hello and welcome to the episode 32 of What A Fab Day. I am your host, Simon Mas. Today, we'll cover the events of the 1st of February, plus those happened during the various Februaries, for which I couldn't find a more precise date. Some highlights of the podcast include live performances, the recording of a new song, and a belligerent meeting. The first day of February of 1961 saw the Beatles performing live at the Hambleton Hall, with Pete Best on drums. On this day in 1962, the Beatles, still featuring Pete Best, were busy with one of their usual lunchtime concerts at the Carvern Club in Liverpool. In the evening, they performed at the grand opening of the Beatle Club. In fact, this was a typical Epstein publicity stunt. The venue was above the Tistel Café, little more than a dance instruction hall, in the quiet town of West Kirby, some 10 miles from Liverpool. Since the place was so offbeat for jive bands, Epstein persuaded the manager of the hall to change the name of the venue, to make a sensational grand opening, and attract more people. The evening went well, with the band getting paid £18, about £390 in 2020 money, and Epstein getting his first commission, at an especially discounted rate of 10%, to celebrate the grand opening. Fun fact! The Beatles never performed at the venue after this night. In early February 1962, the Beatles received a rejection letter from Decca Records, following their audition on the 1st of January 1962. The band, especially John Lennon, resented that Brian Epstein had insisted to select personally the songs for the audition. The lads thought he had been a negative interference. Epstein himself was astonished by the rejection. In the first week of February, he travelled to London to meet the head of Decca A&R, Dick Rowe, and sales manager Sidney Arthur Beecher Stevens, who famously explained to him that the Beatles sounded too much like the Shadows and that guitar groups were on the way out. Epstein lost his temper. They, somewhat patronizingly, suggested that they knew better about that sort of things, and that having heard many a manager promising that their bands would have quickly become the next Elvis or something of the sort, his banter about the Beatles' future did nothing to impress them. In fact, there was another reason behind the refusal to put the Beatles under contract. Dick Crow had auditioned another band on the 1st of January 1962, a local band called Brian Poole and the Tremolos. Following A&R scout Mike Smith's advice, Rowe had decided to concentrate on the tremolos because, being local, they could have been easier to work with and to stay in touch with. Back in Liverpool, Epstein toyed with the idea of offering Decca to buy 3,000 copies of any Beatles single published by the company, but finally decided to let matter drop with a letter dated the 10th of February. In a later interview, Dick Rowe commented, I was never told about that at the time. The way economics were in the record business then, if we'd been sure of selling 3,000 copies, we'd have been forced to record them, whatever sort of group they were. The rejection was a heavy blow for the band, but looking at it in perspective, if Decca had signed them, the Beatles' career would have been very different. One can tell whether or not they would have been more or less successful than they were, but they might have never decided to sack Pete Best in favour of Ringo Starr, changing the group dynamics. Remember that at the end of the day, Best was shown the door only after producer George Martin voiced doubts about his ability. Speaking of which, Martin is another key person in the story of the band that they would have not met without the Decca rejection. 
we will see how the story will pan out in other episodes, but as much as it does seem an empty New Age notion, it might be worth remembering that sometimes things do happen for a reason. Another thing that happened at some point in February 1962 was that Ringo Starr decided to leave Tony Sheridan's band in Hamburg, West Germany. Tired of the singer's bad temper, Ringo decided to go back to Liverpool and rejoin Rory Storm and the Hurricanes. On the 1st of February 1963, the Beatles had two different engagements in the Midlands. The first one was in Manny, at Manny Hall, the name of St. Peter's Church Hall for dance events. The second was at the Assembly Rooms in Tamworth. Of this second gig, we know that the Beatles played for 30 minutes between 11.45 pm and 12.15 am, sharing the bill with Jerry Levine and the Avengers and the Rebels. In 1964, the Beatles performed another two slots at the Olympia Theatre in Paris, France. On the 1st of February 1967, the Fab Four met at the EMI Studios in London to record a new song, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. With Strawberry Fields Forever and Penny Lane due to be released as a single, this was the first song for their next album. The band completed nine takes of the rhythm track between 7.00 pm and 2.30 am. During the session, it was decided to try and record Paul McCartney's bass, plugging it directly into the recording desk, as opposed to the procedure commonly followed at the time, plug in the bass in an amplifier and record the sound of the amplifier. This method, called direct injection or DI for short, had never before been employed in a Beatles session, and perhaps this was one of the first times it had been used worldwide. As we've seen in previous episodes of What A Fab Day, this was just one of the experiments being tried out at the time. In fact, in November 1966, Paul McCartney had the idea of recasting the Beatles as a fictional band to have more creative freedom during the making of the new album. It would just be a matter of time before Sgt. Pepper and his Lonely Hearts Club Band took over the Beatles' next recording project, as we will see in future episodes. In 1968, Ringo Starr was at the television rehearsal rooms in the North Acton neighborhood of London for off-camera daytime rehearsals for his appearance on the Cilla Black's BBC TV series, in an episode broadcast on the 6th of February. On Saturday, 1st of February 1969, there was a meeting with the Beatles, Alan Klein and John Eastman at the Apple's headquarters to discuss the acquisition of NEMS for £1 million, about £14 million in 2020 money. As you might recall from episode 28 of What A Fab Day, NEMS was the management company formed by Beatles' late manager Brian Epstein. While the company was now controlled by his brother Clive and still took 25% off the earnings of the Beatles, the four were managing themselves and, facing financial difficulties, were inclined to use an advance on future earnings from EMI to acquire NEMS and improve their cash flow. John and Lee Eastman, respectively the future father-in-law and brother-in-law of Paul McCartney, had suggested the deal, whereas Alan Klein, the most probable candidate to become the Beatles' new manager, had talked George Harrison, John Lennon and Ringo Starr to postpone it for the moment saying that they could have acquired the company at a lower price if he could be involved in the negotiation. Today's meeting focused on this particular problem. The Eastmans insisted that not only acquiring NEMS would have bettered the band's finances in and out itself, 
The Beatles would have avoided paying 25% of their income to someone else, but that since the company was profitable and with a positive cash flow, the money in Nem's coffin could be used to further pay existing debts. Finally, Nems owned part of Northern Songs Limited, which in turn owned the publishing rights of the Beatles' catalogue of songs, further money generated by the Beatles and paid to someone else. In fact, during the meeting, Paul McCartney made a point to explain that it would have been best for the Beatles to own Nems and Northern Songs. The meeting quickly turned into a shouting match. The Eastmans attacked Klein, raising questions about his integrity and business attitude. Klein replied in his usual harsh tone, saying that the Eastmans were just class-conscious snobs, that they lacked any management expertise in the world of music business, and that they, at best, could offer the band some legal advice. In short, the meeting didn't reach any conclusion and was adjourned on the 3rd of February. On the 1st of February 1970, Ringo Starr and his wife Maureen flew to New York to Los Angeles for another stop to their trip back to London. At some point in February 1970, Paul McCartney telephoned John Lennon to tell him that he, too, intended to leave the Beatles. John replied, Good! That makes two of us who have accepted it mentally. The last nail in the coffin for Paul was when Alan Klein, now manager of the whole band, forced on Paul by John, George and Ringo, tried to prevent McCartney to release his solo album on the ground of a potential clash with the release of Letty B, the old Get Back project whose release had been postponed for more than a year. Paul was so upset by this attempt to stop his own activity that when Ringo went to his house to try and talk things over, Paul kicked him out. Unbeknownst to most people, including everyone at Apple and all the other Beatles, Paul had booked a number of incognito sessions during the month at the Morgan Studios under the pseudonym of Billy Martin to complete his McCartney. There has been a lot of talk about the fact that Let It Be had to come out as soon as possible to fulfill the Beatles' obligations with United Artists, but this is not true. The release of Yellow Submarine, the animation film, served as the third release required by the contract, and Let It Be was not needed for that purpose. This concludes another episode of What A Fab Day. If you liked this episode or this podcast, please visit www.simonmas.com support and check out ways to help me out with my music-related series, even for free. In the episode description, you will find a link to the bibliography of the show with lots of Amazon affiliate links in case you want to help me out with your shopping. Remember, it will not cost you even a single penny more. For the moment, I wish you a good day and a fab continuation. Simon Mas, music you love.